Okay, Luke, a bit of a blast from the past. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to look over one of the uh, papers we wrote way back in 2006 yeah. when you were a lot younger than you are today. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all were. Yes, yes. You, you were still an honours student? No, this was the first. So I started a PhD here oh, that's right. that's for a right. year while I was waiting to find out whether I was going to Cambridge. So. Yes, yes. But, it, but it, it's a really interesting paper uh, that um, was written by myself, yourself, and Baron James yep. and Matt Francis. And Matt Francis. And it was inspired by a paper that we saw by uh, a person who was a student in Cambridge when I was there. That's um, Alan Whitein. Yep. And he wrote this little paper on essentially how should we think about expanding space yeah. in the universe, right? So we've got our cosmological model. The universe is, is evolving. Space is expanding. Things are moving apart from each other. So should we think of space like a river? I, yeah. like, you know, you, you play poo sticks. Poo sticks is a simple game which may be played on any bridge over running water. Each player drops a stick on the upstream side of a bridge and the one whose stick first appears on the downstream side is the winner. You drop a stick into the river. Off it goes because of the, the flow of the river. Yeah. Is space the same? So we wrote this paper called... Yeah. Called Joining the Hubble Flow, Implications for Expanding Space. Um, I, I should also mention, it, we were also responding to some comments by uh, John Peacock in his, uh, in his textbook, Cosmology. Mm -hmm. Uh, and he wrote, he's got online a sort of addendum to it where he's, he has a bit more of a discussion, actually cites, cites this paper or I think this one or another one. Um, and so if that book ever went underwent a second edition, we'd be in it. So yes, if people yeah. could just buy that and recommend to Cambridge University Press that they should do another printing, that would be that'd be great for us. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is my first um, monthly notices paper. This was, uh, this was big for me. And just explain to the, uh, the listeners what we mean by monthly notices. Monthly notices is, is a wonderfully understated name for basically the premier astro astronomical journal in, and cosmology and astrophysics and all of that in the, uh, in the UK. So it's monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society. So it's just a it's a scientific journal, and obviously it started off way way back when, oh, eighteen hundred somewhere. Yeah, 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 as just sort of it's sort of like a newsletter they just put out, but it's now, it, it's now basically one of the top. It's it's one of the premier ones in the world. So this was, this was uh, yeah, I was very happy with this. So, to be so and just to get clear, that means it has undergone that uh, thing called peer review. Peer review, indeed, yes. And uh, we we had to deal with peer reviewers. That was all new for for most of us, I think. Okay. So, so he was the, the, here's the argument that uh, Whiting and Peacock put forward. Okay? So we're thinking of expanding space. And the question is not, do we need a new mathematical model? We're all fine with the mathematical model. That's not what we're doing here. The question is, should we use the words expanding space to describe what's going on in this model? And the argument for no goes like this. Uh, what they say was, okay, let's do a test case where... I imagine holding, taking a, a test mass, you know, I take a star or something, or a galaxy, and I have a really long arm, and I put it out there in the universe, a couple of million light years away, but I hold it still with respect to me. Mm -hmm. So, so you know, as, as I measure its distance, it stays the same, stays the same, stays the same, and then I, I release it into the universe. Um, if, if you're thinking of expanding space like a river, like you said, uh, you might expect that what's going to happen is the sort of space will rush past it and it'll push it along and gradually it will it'll it'll come to expand with the rest of the universe out in that direction okay uh, and what they pointed out was actually you know if you write down the equations of the model that we have what actually happens is if the universe if the universe just has matter in it uh, that that matter is always attractive so it's a decelerating expansion when you let go, Okay, you hold this thing out. I should do this for the camera, shouldn't I? You hold it out in the universe and you let it go and off it goes. Okay? No, that's not what actually happens. You, you let it go and it actually comes towards you, uh, which is not what people expect. So, so, so let me just um, think about this correctly, right? So uh, I was an author on this paper, so I should try and remember some of this. <laughs> so what we've got is, uh, as you said, yeah, let's, let's imagine we've got an expanding universe. Here's the Milky Way. Yep. Here's another distant galaxy and it's moving away from us. Yep. Right? 
You throw out a lasso, you hold on to it. Yeah, that's not okay. how to do it. Yeah. So you've got it held there, so it's a fixed distance. All the other galaxies are still yep. expanding away. And the question is, what happens when you cut the rope? And you might say, well, cut the rope, space expands in between, so this guy will start to move off into the universe again. Right. Okay. But what you're saying is, is that you cut the rope, and it actually falls towards, must pass through. And out the other side, actually. And then what happens on, on the other side? It actually... Uh it will eventually, in some sense, which is what our sort of paper was about, it will rejoin the Hubble flow. So it will eventually be one of the galaxies which is just sort of expanding out there. But it actually does this out the other side. So it will join the Hubble flow, if you like, behind us. So it will go through us, ignore any collision or something like that. It will just, it'll actually join the Hubble flow back out there. Okay. So how are we supposed to understand this, right? Because... Uh, you pick up a textbook, you see the words expand in space, mm -hmm. uh, and you often hear about these analogies, right? This expanded space is like the, uh, the surface of a balloon, yeah. and you've blown up the balloon, and so the rubber stretches, and so you, the space in between us is stretching. So why, why, why does it fall towards us? Well, there's a couple of ways to understand this, but I'll, I'll give you my, my favorite one. Um, Remember, I mean, this is this is all in the in, in the context of Einstein's theory of relativity. So we should be able to, to, to take any perspective we like on this whole situation and, okay. and work out what's going on. And so let's take the perspective of a galaxy. Here's our the one we held on to. Let's take a galaxy which is at the basically the same position, but in the Hubble flow. It's 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 expanding yeah. with the universe. You, you use some jargon there. In okay. the Hubble flow. In the Hubble flow. So uh, when we talk about the expansion of space the expansion of the universe um there's a for, for each point in the universe there's a certain way that something is moving to be moving with the overall expansion so if you're in that you'll see all the other galaxies moving away from you in exactly the same way uh, you'll see a cosmic microwave background which is looks the same in every directions uh to uh you know on average uh and so okay here's us here's the galaxy we tethered and here's one next to it. And that one's moving away from us in the usual expansion of space. Well, instead of thinking about this from our perspective, let's think about it from the perspective of the, the, the neighbor. Right. Okay, we'll call that the neighboring galaxy. All right, what's happening now? Well, what happens now is they see us moving away. Okay? Because mm -hmm. it's totally symmetric. We see them moving away. They see us moving away. So can I just say, so, so they, they, there they are in the universe. This lasso comes out, grabs it, and looks like it's pulling yeah, exactly. the galaxy away. Okay, out of the Hubble flow. So, so yeah, what's happened is that galaxy over there grabbed a hold of the one next to me. I'm on the neighboring galaxy. Here's the lassoed galaxy. They grabbed a hold of that and yanked it that way. Okay. Okay. Um, and so the question now is, what happens next? So there's... There's, there's us moving away and there's this galaxy moving away at the same speed. Right. So to first approximation, what happens next is those two galaxies just sort of move away. But the interesting thing is because the acceleration of space is slowing down, our velocity, the neighbor, when it looks at our velocity, is slowing down because all the velocities are slowing down. The expansion of space is slowing down. And so... What happens next is we've, we've set up this race between the two, but now we slow down, and so the tethered galaxy starts to catch up with us. Oh, this is like one of those funniest home videos with a kid on a skateboard behind a car with a rope, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so Th this car slows down, the one that wants... Yeah. yeah. So that's, uh, that's not bad, actually. That's, that's basically what happens. The, the other galaxy, the, the tethered galaxy moves towards us because we slow down because of the attraction of, of space. Right, so, so, so it falls towards us, it passes through, then it goes out the other side mm -hmm. and it comes to rest with regards to other galaxies but it's still moving away from us yes right? yeah yeah so the other part of this which was interesting was there was a so that, so that we sort of understand i think by that sort of let's imagine we're on the neighboring galaxy we can sort of get a better handle of we can still talk about expanding space and we're, we're still as long as you do it that way you can sort of handle this case of the thing comes towards us instead of away from us um I should say, in ordinary Newtonian cosmology, if you're not thinking general relativity, you just think of things moving away and gravity pulling them in. The reason why the galaxy comes towards us is just good old-fashioned gravitational attraction. It's still, there's a big mass here. It moves towards the centre of the mass that it is still with respect to. 
Um, so that's fairly straightforward, but we can still understand it. But then and Whiting had a further argument and he, here was his point. Okay, let's look at that aftermath. Okay, here's the tethered galaxy. Here's us. It's gone through us. It's out the other side. And the expanding space people say this thing will rejoin the Hubble flow. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and which which is not a precise uh, mathematically defined thing, right? Rejoining the Hubble flow. It, there's actually a few different things, which is what we were teasing out in our article that that might mean. What what um, what Whiting proposed that it means is okay. Look. There's a place in the Hubble flow where this galaxy should end up, given how it's moving, if it's going to rejoin the Hubble flow. So it starts over here, it's moving. But there's a spot over there where you're like, okay, that's where you end up eventually in terms of what are called co-moving coordinates, in terms of relative to the other galaxy. So, so suppose that, you know, um, you know, relative to a map of where the galaxies are, it's a sort of expanding map, but there's a place it's supposed to end up. And what Whiting worked out was actually because of the expansion of space, um, it, it actually gets further and further away from that point. Um, and in particular because of the deceleration of space. This is the thing we, we really teased out in our article. So in, in that definition of rejoining the Hubble flow, that doesn't actually hold. It, it doesn't actually move closer in terms of physical meters to that point in the universe, even though in the expanding coordinates, it is actually moving. So this is a kind of a weird thing. So here's what we did. Um, when when cosmologists started talking about uh, joining the Hubble flow, rejoining the Hubble flow, uh, there were a couple of different definitions of what they meant by that. So we could use these expanding co-moving coordinates and say, all right, uh, you've rejoined the Hubble flow. You rejoin the Hubble flow if your your speed through those coordinates goes to zero, mm -hmm. or maybe you rejoin the Hubble flow when you approach a particular coordinate in in uh, in in that in those coordinates, or maybe like um, you want your velocity with respect to everything else around you to go to zero, because if everything around you is in the Hubble flow, and eventually I come to a point where I don't, I, nothing around me is moving like this way or that way or, you know, on average nothing's moving. Maybe that's the Hubble flow. Or maybe you can use um, Whiting's definition of I get physically closer to that final place where I'm supposed to be. And so we, we wrote out actually in the end about seven definitions. So it was a pretty fiddly paper in the end. Yes. There's a, there's a, there's a very <laughs> well needed table that summarizes them all. And, and in the end, the answer was, um, some of these definitions, all you need for them to hold is that the expansion, the universe is expanding. That'll do. Um, so in particular, the fact that eventually it's called your peculiar velocity. What's your, what's your speed relative to the sort of rest frame of everything around you? That goes to zero. All that needs is expansion. So in that sense, expansion is enough to make things rejoin the Hubble flow. But if you take some of these other definitions, um, Actually, they only hold if the universe ends up in an accelerating expansion. And that's an interesting kind of thing. Yeah. Um, actually, an accelerating expansion sort of drives things into their position in the Hubble flow, whereas a decelerating expansion can leave a bit of a mess. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So that our tethered galaxy doesn't quite rejoin and, and things are sort of ne not, never quite where they're supposed to be. And, and so this was, I think, sort of... The, the point of the paper, if you're going to talk about rejoining the Hubble flow, um, you know, I, the sense in which that's true is the sense that your velocity it tend, with respect to everything else tends to go to zero. Yeah, yeah. Um, anything more than that, you're actually making assumptions about the way the universe ends up expanding. And so actually Whiting had a, had a pretty reasonable point there. Um, and I think the point that he and, and, and Peacock, John Peacock, were, were both making there was, You've got to be careful with this whole expanding space thing. It, I, we came to the conclusion, and we might discuss one of our other papers next time. Expanded um, space, the root of all evil? Question mark. Yeah. Um, uh, I get, uh, authored by Matt Francis, uh, where we just sort of you know, 
nutted this out in a bit more detail, but I, I think the short story is you've got to be a bit careful because, I mean, the universe is not a giant rubber sheet. It's not it a giant, not a giant, rubber giant balloon. Well, one of the best comments made uh, was by our uh, another one of our office mates, Brendan Brewer. Um, so we were we are the, we're sort of the GR people, and he's a, a stats and probability guru. He's like you know the one we go to for that sort of stuff. But he <laughs> he made the comment: the problem with you guys is you understand the expansion of space. You don't understand rubber sheets, <laughs> that was, and that was pretty much spot on. The problem with that analogy is that actually the universe is is easier to understand than a big expanding rubber sheet. Although, Absolutely, uh, you know that analogy is not too bad. Yeah.